Today on The Help Podcast, we're going to help you get real. Well, welcome to The Help Podcast. We're glad you decided to join us this afternoon. Uh, today we have our special guest with us. That is Pastor Kenny Quinlan. He is currently the youth director out at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Ashtabula, Ohio. And uh, thankful for his friendship, his ministry, him and his lovely wife and their little daughter are a blessing to our family and our ministry personally. And we figured that they would be a blessing to you. Uh, they would be able to help you in some things. And one thing I've appreciated about Brother, Brother Quinlan and his wife is uh, their authenticity. And um, I'm thankful that uh, they keep a high standard in their life. Uh, but at the same time, they're very meek about it, and I'm thankful for that, thankful for his friendship. And so we've invited him today to speak with us about helping us get real today. And uh, so, Brother Quinlan, we're glad to see you uh, here on the podcast with us. Good to have you. Good to be here, Pastor. Thanks so much for inviting me out. It's certainly an honor. And, uh, man, we've sure appreciated your friendship over the years. I think you're one of the first people that I met when I became a youth pastor and uh, was just drawn to what God was doing in your life and your youth group at the time. And uh, so thanks so much for having me join you today. Well, amen. Well, I want to give you uh, an opportunity to give us a little bit about who you are. Uh, maybe give us a little bit about uh, how you met your wife and uh, your brief testimony, how you got saved and, and uh, what you did up to this point, basically, to getting you to be uh, the youth director at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Thing. Well, I'm blessed to actually be a third generation preacher. My grandfather on my dad's side was a missionary to the Philippines for a number of years. So my dad grew up on the mission field in the Philippines. And when he was about 14 years old, he found a pamphlet on his dad's desk that talked about unreached people groups. And one of them was about the nation of Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, the fourth largest country in the world by population. And immediately, right then at 14 years old, he felt the call of God on his life, not only to preach, not only to missions, but specifically to go to Indonesia. And so he went to Bible college, met my mom. They got married, had a couple kids here stateside, did um, a deputation, and then went off to the mission field. And about a year later, in the city of Yogyakarta in 1989, I was born there in Indonesia. And I uh, spent most of my childhood growing up there on the mission field with them. It wasn't until I was about 17 years old, though, that I really started to take the things of God seriously. And I surrendered my life to the Lord. Whatever he wanted me to do, I was willing to do it. And uh, a few weeks later, he called me to preach, uh, specifically to be a youth pastor, to work with teenagers. Uh, my youth pastor at the time had been a huge blessing to me. And I wanted to try to be that for somebody else in the future. And uh, so I was going into my senior year of high school and had a great senior year trying to serve the Lord and learn about him and work with my dad, of course, who was a preacher and my youth pastor at the time. I was in the States and he was a great help to me. Went to Bible college uh, at West Coast Baptist College and uh, really enjoyed my time there. I had the privilege of traveling in one of the singing groups to represent the college. And one of the churches we went to uh, was a church named Clearview Baptist Church in Mississippi. And there I met Pastor Nepshield, and he and I just really hit it off. The Lord knit our hearts together, and uh, I knew I wanted to spend as much time with him as possible and work with him if possible. And so the Lord moved and worked in our lives. And the next summer, the summer of 2011, I actually wound up interning for him for that entire summer. And that's where the story kind of gets fun. Uh, there was a lady there named Sandra Whedon, or as we call her now, Aunt Sandy. And she was actually my wife's great aunt. She went to church there and uh, invited me over for a family Memorial Day get together. Since I didn't have any family in the area and she really wanted to hook me up with her great niece named Emily, she invited me out to their family get together and not being one to turn down a free meal, I decided to go and risk meeting this Emily character that I had heard so much about at that point. While we both had our escape plans, I figured I could eat and leave and Emily figured she could eat and go upstairs and read a book, uh, depending on whether or not we hit it off. Uh, but the Lord was in it. And uh, I've never been a big fan of the idea of love at first sight. But that's kind of how God did it for us. We met each other that day. I met her whole family, mom, dad, aunts, and uncles. And uh, we hit it right off and, and fell in love and started talking and getting to know each other. And it was an exciting time. I found out much later, talking to her dad, I think it was about the time that I asked him if I could marry his daughter. 
he kind of smiled and he said yes. And he said, you know, the day you guys met, I was watching you interact. And I just, I just had a piece from the Holy Spirit. And his wife, Ruth, came and talked to him, asked him what he thought. And he said, you know, I think that's the guy that's going to marry our daughter on the day that we met. And uh, so it was exciting just to see the Lord work through that. Uh, we got engaged over Thanksgiving break. Uh, we got to go to the Biltmore in uh, Asheville, North Carolina and get engaged there. And uh, then I graduated from my senior year of college and uh, we got married in 2012. And that was a blessing. Uh, Emily is actually was not going to West Coast at the time we met. She was a freshman at Pensacola Christian College. But um, since we met and started dating each other that summer, uh, her dad gave permission for her to transfer out to West Coast so we could spend that year together and get to know each other um, as we were heading towards marriage. And uh, we got married a year and four days after we met. And I've got to say that was probably the greatest year of my life, meeting my wife and starting to date her and getting engaged and doing all that stuff and ultimately getting married. And uh, it was a very sweet and very precious time for sure. Amen. I, I love those testimonies about how the Lord brings people together. And not only that, but just seeing how uh, it that God gave the father a piece. And as a father of four daughters, I can certainly appreciate that, knowing that God says, hey, this is the guy that's going to marry my daughter on day one. People would say, oh, that's so crazy. But uh, is it really with the Holy Spirit and, and leading and guiding us? And that's what we're resting upon is the Holy Spirit. Boy, uh, that's encouraging. I love I love marriage stories. I love to see how people meet. And uh, so I'm encouraged by that. And now, you mentioned at the very beginning about being on the mission field. Now, how did the being on the mission field and seeing different cultures uh, affect a view of how you view things today? I mean, what did uh, maybe what did people think of the American culture uh, when you were there? Did they perceive it as good or bad? Is that in your memory base? Sure, absolutely. I mean, it certainly broadened my view of ministry. Um, I got saved on the mission field. At, at five years old, I've been asking questions about heaven and hell and salvation and what that meant. And uh, so my dad led me to the Lord one day when I was five after lunch. And I uh, just distinctly remember knowing I was a sinner and I needed a savior. And just astounded that God would love me enough to send his son to die on the cross for my sins. And I accepted him. So you don't have to be in America or any specific place to get saved. You can get saved anywhere. And um, I was also just blown away by the great need. I mean, we have great needs in our country for sure, but there are great needs all over the world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world by population. Um, and, and people are just packed in together. The island of Java, where I grew up, is about the size of the state of Mississippi, square mileage, um, except there's a whole lot more people. There's about 140 million people on the island of Java, and there's about 3 million people in the state of Mississippi. Um, our most populous state, California, has about 40 million people in it. And it is much, much bigger than the island of Java. It's about three times the size of the island of Java. Uh, but the island of Java still has three and a half times more people on it. There were just people everywhere. And being the largest Muslim country in the world, the vast majority of them not only were not saved, um, but did not know what the gospel was. If they had heard about Jesus, they would have just heard that he was a prophet. He was just a man, um, as we see in the Muslim ideology. But most of them, if you said, hey, do you know the gospel? Do you know how to get to heaven? They, they would not know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they could ask him to save them from their sins and, and go to heaven. And so I was just astounded, even as a child, at the great need uh, that there was there. Secondly, I was always blown away by the lack of freedom that they have there compared to our nation. And I really do believe we live in the greatest country in the world with the greatest freedoms in the world. And we can go to church and, and really not see a lot of repercussions from that. But growing up, there were particularly ladies uh, in Indonesia who would come to church and their families would be very upset, especially if they got baptized, because that's a public profession of faith. We understand that we don't get baptized to get saved, but we get baptized to tell other people that we are saved. And so with that public profession of, hey, I'm a Christian now and I want to serve God, uh, they would be ostracized. Sometimes they would lose their jobs. Sometimes they would be disowned by their families. Sometimes they would even be beaten by the men in their families, maybe a dad or a brother or an uncle uh, would, would beat them, sometimes with two by fours and things. Uh, one lady, uh, her family was so ashamed of her that they shaved her head so that she would be too ashamed to come to church. And uh, so what did she do? She put a stocking cap on and decided to go to church anyway, even though her, her head had been shaved. And 
So I'm just so thankful for the freedoms that we have here. And uh, it's a good reminder to be appreciative of those things and to fight for those things. As nowadays, we see that uh, there are forces in our country that are trying to take those freedoms away a little by little. And um, certainly those, those two things, just the great need and then the great freedoms we have here and what a blessing they are, stood out to me as a child on the mission field. How did they perceive you as Americans over there in Indonesia um, comparatively to what they are? Was that, was that difficult for you guys? Uh, not really. On a personal, individual basis, uh, people were mostly kind. I'm sure there were plenty that were not big fans of America. Uh, back then, social media isn't what it is today. And so their view of America was basically what they saw on TV, Hollywood movies and stuff. So as you can guess, it, it was a pretty weird view of America. Everybody lives in ginormous houses and drives expensive cars and does all these weird, crazy, dramatic things. Um, but I think it's funny that people just love America and they love to hate America, whether they are American or not. Uh, we see that there's countless number of people trying to get into America, legally or otherwise, uh, because they understand how great our country is. Um, and yet people all over the world are constantly blasting America. And then even people in our own country, they love to hate America and all the terrible things that are going on here. But it's funny how none of them ever leave. No matter how much somebody who lives in America hates America, it's very, very rare to see someone actually pick up roots and go to a different country and live there. And, and I believe the reason is that deep, deep down, they understand uh, that this really is uh, the land of the free and the home of the brave and a country that's been, been blessed by God, whether they would admit it or not. And it is a great place to live. So I think it's kind of vogue um, to despise America a little bit. But I really think even across the globe, deep down, people, people realize that this is a great place. We do have a lot of freedoms here. Well, Amen. I wanted to take that time to, to, to maybe a little more in length to describe kind of who you are, where you come from, and kind of get your perspective on some of these things. Because uh, now I kind of want to get in the meat of it, what we talked about, being a help to be real in today. Now, one of the stigmas we have as Christians oftentimes is that uh, of hypocrisy and being fake and things like that. That, uh, And unfortunately, there are people like out that. Peter dealt with it in his day. Uh, you see that in his epistles. You see Paul deals with it. You see it all throughout Scripture, people that were um, doing things for a show or doing things for uh, to, to seem more blessed than, than what they were or more holy than they were. Uh, people even that faked... Um, um, faked fasting, uh, doing things like that. And there's always been that stigma. And so for us being real and authentic Christians is, is vital today uh, for us. Now, I want to say, I want to ask you a question. How, in your opinion or through scripture, do you see us being able to maintain a high standard in a low standard society? For sure. And uh, I think we do live in a low standard society in a lot of areas. I think we even live in a no standard society that everybody should just do whatever they want and, and you can't tell me to do. There almost isn't even a reality of right and wrong anymore if you just look at the culture, kind of, a, of a, if it feels good, do it. Uh, but the word of God is very clear uh, that God wants us to have standards, that there are uh, certain rules he wants us to follow and that we need to be obedient in those things. First Corinthians 5.1, um, just as an example, says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication uh, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you and then a few verses later he says your glorying is not good so we see that the people in the church of Corinth even these Christians uh, not only were they doing things that they knew were wrong, they were glorying in it. They were excited about it. And I kind of feel that's how our society is these days. Uh, it's a difficult time to have high standards because it is definitely not the popular thing uh, to do. Uh, just the, the definition of things, for example, we talk about modesty. Uh, the Bible says in a few places that the thigh is nakedness, and that goes for a man or a woman. But the world's definition of nakedness, its standard of nakedness is, is very different. I tell my teenagers sometimes that according to the world, you could cover up a woman's nakedness with about three quarters if you place them in just the right place, that that, that person's no longer naked anymore. And so we see that that's a very low standard. And then even recently, uh, in the last 10 years, maybe with this progression of the LGBTQ society and of immorality, we see that there is no standard in that sense, that there's nothing wrong 
uh, with our nation and their ideals when it comes to promiscuity or homosexuality or transgenderism, that those things are just okay. There is stand no standard. Whatever you want to do, just go ahead and do it, and it's not wrong. Uh, we even see the idea of, of a low standard in work uh, to where many believe now that you shouldn't have to work and the government should just take care of you if you don't want to work and those kinds of things. There's no standard there for someone to uh, really be able to work hard. Uh, if I work harder than you and if I spend more time at the job than you and I should, I should get paid more. I should have, I should have more because of that. But today's society says, no, 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 somebody else who works in the same place should get paid exactly the same amount that you do. So there's a very low standard for a lot of things in our life these days. And uh, e even in immigration, uh, there should be no standard there. A lot of people say anybody should just come in whenever they want, no matter their background, no matter the danger to other people. And uh, so we definitely see this idea of the world around us being very low standard or even no standard. And uh, it, it, it's tough to be a Christian, I think, uh, during this time and have high standards. But it's still very important, just as it was before during Paul's day and Peter's day. I 100% agree with you, and being, uh, and you're learning this, I think, quickly that your daughter's getting older now, and how old is she again? My daughter's two and a half. So two and a half years old, and so she's growing uh, day by day, and she is learning how to be a young woman. I know at two and a half, it seems silly to say that, but that's the truth of it. She's learning how to be a young woman. And uh, so we see there's an importance, not just uh, for church or your quote unquote religion, uh, but there is more at stake, especially for a parent and in the future we're growing in. So how is that standard that you have for your home and uh, biblically what you're basing it upon important in your marriage and in your, in your own life and, and also in your ministry? And, and with that being said as well, how do you convey that uh, sometimes to your teenagers and even to their families that, hey, we need to have a high standard uh, for what we're doing, um, especially in a society that says, well, this is 2020, uh, things are different, which they are, they are different, um, but how do we still maintain a high standard without uh, without seeming legalistic or seeing as it's the becoming the thing that gets us close to God as opposed to getting close to God? Absolutely, for sure. I think it's, it's important to start with the fact and even the idea that it is hard. Um, I think it's easy to be what we would call pharisaical or hypocritical as uh, Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the New Testament constantly. Uh, they had the highest standards of all. And yet Jesus said that they were like whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones, that they would clean the outside of the cup, but uh, the inside of the cup would be full of ravening wickedness. The picture he painted was very graphic. He called them serpents. He called them snakes and vipers and a wicked generation, but they had the highest standards of all. So I think sometimes it's easy to take that extreme to have really high standards and then just to kind of use that as a club to beat other people with when they don't have the same standards that you do. And I think that's totally wrong. I think it's also pretty easy to have the other extreme of just having no standards at all. Just do whatever you want. Don't worry about what other people do. God will kind of work it all out in the end. And he probably doesn't even really care. We live in the age of grace. So I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't really need to worry about standards. That's kind of an easy route to go as well. But to be real, to be genuine, to have a balance in your life of having standards, but still being able to love people and to help people who have a different standard than you is challenging. But I think that's what we need to strive for. That's what Jesus did. Jesus had the, the highest standards of all because he was perfect. He never sinned one time, but he still didn't shy away from reaching out to the harlots and the publicans and the sinners and those people because he cared about those people and he loved them. And so it's important for us to have that same kind of a balance too. I think the number one reason it's important to have standards is because God told us to. It reminds me of when I was a child, I would ask my mom questions, things like, why is the sky blue? And why is the grass green? And just those kinds of questions that children ask. And ultimately, my mom would come to the final conclusion that because God made it so, that's why the sky is blue. That's why we look the way we do and we are shaped the way we're shaped and the world functions the way it functions. It's ultimately because God made it so. And the reason that standards are important, first and foremost, number one, is because God made it so. Second Corinthians six seventeen says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So God tells us to be separate from the world in the way that we act, in the standards that we have. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see that God has this idea that we are to be different. We are to be called out. We are special, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ did for us on the cross and because we are the children of God. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So we know there's things that we're supposed to stay away from. And God's made that clear in his word. And so that's why it's a priority for me personally in, in my life to have these standards. They help me uh, obey God and, and try to be as close to him and obedient to him as possible. Uh, the second reason why I think standards are important for myself personally um, is a selfish one. Just to be frank, I want the blessings of God in my life. I want good things in my life. I want a long life. I want God's blessing on my family and on my ministry. And when I obey him, when I do the things that he says, uh, then he blesses me. He makes it very clear in his word. And one of the things that really helps me obey God and keep my mind in the right place and keep my actions in the right direction is to have high standards. Uh, now, as for my family, my marriage, my children, uh, my ministry, I think there's really three important aspects uh, that stick out to me when we talk about why having high standards is important. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's just safe. I think having high standards is safe. And we see this all around us, particularly in the law and the government. And I think about when, when we're driving. There's actually a lot of standards for somebody to follow when they're driving. Somebody has to be of a certain age. They have to have certain training. They have to have a permit first, at least here in Ohio. Um, they must uh, get a license. They must wear their seatbelt. They can only drive so many miles per hour. And there's all these laws and all these standards, if you want to put it that way, for somebody to be able to drive. Why? Because we're keeping the driver safe and we're keeping the passenger safe and we're keeping the other drivers on the road safe and nobody really balks at that nobody really complains about that but when we talk about spiritual standards biblical standards that we apply in our own lives to help keep us safe all of a sudden that's a big problem and and that's an affront to people but really that's one of the main reasons why we have high standards is is for safety if my wife and i decide that neither one of us will ever be alone with someone of the opposite gender, it makes it much harder for us to fall into a sin like adultery. If I have a standard for my daughter, who's two and a half, that she's not allowed to just roam the neighborhood by herself and play out in the street, well, she's a lot like, less likely to get run over by a car or to be abducted by some stranger because there's a standard for her where she can play and where she can't. It helps to keep her safe. And uh, I don't know about you, but I remember being a teenager and having the raging hormones and all that kind of stuff. One of our standards is, as a youth group, we don't let teenagers sit next together on the bus if it's a guy and a girl. Well, that keeps them from holding hands and doing other things uh, at night when the lights are off or when nobody's looking or paying attention or people are sleeping on the bus. It just keeps those things from happening. I can't point to a chapter and verse in the Bible and say that thou shalt not let teen guys and teen girls sit together on the bus. And I think if a teenage guy and a teenage girl do sit together on the bus, that they're not necessarily committing a sin. But for our youth group, we set that standard just to keep the temptation at bay, to keep them safe. And those are just some, some very small examples there. Uh, I also think that it's important to have high standards, to, to have God's blessing. I mentioned this in my own life, but I want God's blessing in my family. I want God's blessing on my daughter. I want God's blessing in my youth group. And we see that um, God blesses those who are in proximity to those who are doing right and being blessed. As an example, we see in scripture that Laban was blessed, not because he was special, but because Jacob was special. And because God's blessing was on Jacob, we also saw God's blessing was on Laban. And Laban acknowledged that. We see that in the life of Joseph, where Potiphar was blessed uh, because of Joseph's work in Potiphar's house. Not because Potiphar did anything good and right, but because Joseph was good and right. And so I want to be good and right so that my daughter can receive blessings from that just because she's in proximity to me. And I personally experienced that, having grown up in a fantastic home with a wonderful mother and a wonderful father who loved God and served him and had high standards. Even when I wasn't really seeking the Lord in my teenage years, I still abundantly received blessings that just kind of bubbled over from the blessings that God was pouring into my parents' life. And so the more that I'm doing right and the more that my youth group is doing right and the more that my family is doing right, 
even those around us in our proximity uh, can be partakers of the blessings, let alone us personally. And finally, I think it's important for us to have high standards in order for us to have a good testimony. First Peter 2, 12 says, having your conversation, which means lifestyle, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Again, my mother used to tell me all the time as an as a, as a older teenager that little eyes are watching. Children younger than you are watching your every move, and, and they're trying to decipher what's good and right and wrong and what they should and shouldn't do based on what they see in you. And that's true for us as Christians living in the world. Even the world understands that the stereotype Christian is supposed to be more kind, charitable, pleasant, and joyful than the average person. When you and I pray in public before we eat at a McDonald's or a Red Lobster or something, other people see that, and that's a good testimony. That's a good standard that we should have. When my youth group shows up at laser tag and the ladies are dressed modestly and the guys are dressed sharply and they have a good attitude and they have a pleasant spirit about them, other people see that. Those people at laser tag know who we are. I called them three weeks in advance and said, hey, I've got a youth group coming. We're going to be playing laser tag. Can you give us a church discount? They ask me for a name and I say Lighthouse Baptist Church. And so it's important for us to have that good testimony. And how hard would it be for my family to reach our neighbors and those around us if we were constantly yelling and, and fighting and bickering and if we didn't ourselves go to church on Sunday morning, if the car stayed parked in the driveway when they should be pulling out and we should be dressed in our nicest clothes because we're going to the house of God. People see those things and it's a good testimony for them. I do think it's important to point out uh, that we don't really believe in, in the idea of lifestyle evangelism, that we never have to share the gospel with others. Just our lifestyle will show that to them. No, we should still go out and preach the gospel and, and try, try to go soul winning and reach others. Uh, but at the same time, it is important for us, too, to have a good testimony. And uh, that may help somebody along that path. When we do try to reach them, they know that we've had a good testimony for them. So I think those three things are very important for my ministry, for my family, to keep us safe to have God's blessings on our lives, and to have a good testimony for the Lord. You know, I, I thought to myself as you're speaking that it is so vital about being authentic in the way that your standards are because when you're talking about being a good neighbor and, and trying to reach people, uh, not, not just through a lifestyle evangelism, but giving yourself the opportunity to have that testimony to give them the gospel, uh, oftentimes when people are disappointed, even if it's a false accusation, it's because of the claim that we are not who we say we are. Isn't that uh, sometimes the damage is they, people will say, oh, well, aren't you a Christian? You're supposed to be this and that. And it's always kind of made me um, laugh a little bit to know that unbelievers often know what we should be as believers more so than we do, I feel sometimes. Uh, but, you know, being authentic is, is tremendous because I think of, the years I've worked in youth ministry, I've never seen a kid disappointed because somebody was authentic with them. Uh, they may be disappointed because they wanted to get away with something, but they were never disappointed because what they said was, uh, wasn't was what they thought they were going to get. Uh, when somebody sees what they get, what they see is what they get is always a blessing to somebody saying, I can count on this person. When I talk to them, I can, I can go to them for advice because I know what they tell me. They're not just giving me some script. They're giving me things probably that they have worked on in their own life or things that God has spoke to them about and they're just trying to be real uh, with me and help me out. Um, you know, like I said before, you may not always like the answer, but knowing that you have somebody that's authentic, knowing you have somebody that, that is who they say they are, uh, to me is, is far greater in the blessings that they are. So it's a difference between legalism and and standards. Legalism being the sense of, of saying that this is by me doing those things, the way I dress, what I listen to, things like that, get me closer to God. We know that's not the case. However, it is safe. As Brother Quinlan said, it is safe. Um, I'm not going to let my kids do certain things. I have We have the same standard for our youth group. We're not going to have kids sitting together because why give them that opportunity? I know if I leave, I know if I leave a child in a room with cookies, all right? You leave your daughter in the room with cookies and you say, honey, don't touch these. After a while, when she thinks nobody's around, what do you think she's going to do with those cookies? She's going to eat them. And there's going to be crumbs on her face, and she's going to tell you to your face that she didn't eat them. It's just how kids are. And, and I don't care how old you are. I've had adults in recent days tell me something that wasn't true 
it's a self-defense mechanism. You, you have that to where, oh man, I've been caught, I'm gonna retract and I'm gonna try to sell it off, you know? Uh, and so one, one, you know, sometimes the things people say, uh, like I'll say, you know me, Brother Quinlan, I say all kinds of silly things and uh, one, one of the young men were acting up on the bus, I said, if you keep that up, when I get home, I'm gonna convince your parents you never came on this trip, all right? You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, but uh, it's, it's that uh, sense of having that uh, relationship or whatever with the kids or what have you. But uh, so we, we, it is safe. It is safe for our kids to be able to have those standards to protect them and not give them that opportunity to fall into that sin or, or choose that sin. So now I, I want to ask you this question. Now, when we look really in uh, Galatians chapter 2, you know, we're talking about uh, spiritual liberty, the freedom we have in our salvation. Do you believe that? Uh, that Paul is confronting Peter because of how important it is to be authentic in our Christian life? Absolutely. And speaking of authenticity to what you were saying, I don't feel like I need high standards in my life because I'm a great person or because it makes me holy. I need high standards in my life for the complete opposite reason. Uh, Because my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And, And I think the difference sometimes between those who are trying to have high standards and be authentic and those that are trying to be more hypocritical and pharisaical is that idea. How how do you see yourself? Or more importantly, how does God see you? Because God sees me, sure, as his child and sure, as redeemed, um, but I have that sin nature. And so I need that help because I am weak. And I don't have standards because it makes me a great person. I have them because I know I'm not a great person and they help me to try to be more like Christ, not that I always succeed. As for Paul and Peter, absolutely. Uh, Anybody who acts one way around certain people and then drastically, drastically different around other people um, is lacking in authenticity. It's really easy to say that about Peter, but to be fair, I think we all struggle with that a little bit. We all want to be accepted. Mm -hmm. We all want to be desirable. And we feel like we're more accepted when people agree with us and when we agree with them. And I think that's kind of where Peter was at. He wanted to be accepted by this group of Jewish Christians. And he realized that hanging out with these Gentile Christians was not going to lead to that acceptance. And so he was carried away uh, by that with his lack of authenticity. But if you look at Paul, what's Paul's focus on here? Paul's focus is on the people. Peter's focus is on the standard. And it's important for us to to understand that our focus needs to be on people. We need to focus on loving people where they're at, regardless of what their standards are and regardless of what our standards are. God loves people. He sent his son to die on the cross, not to set standards, but to save people. And because he loved people. And I think one of the things that Paul was saying to Peter when he withstood him to the face, as the Bible said, was that, hey, you need to get your eyes off yourself. You need to get your eyes off these standards and, and how other people see you. And you need to start looking at other people who need you to be this great apostle and this great preacher and this great pastor and to lift them up and disciple them and encourage them and set a good example for them. And I think once Peter understood that, got his eyes a little bit off himself and, and, and his pride and how he wanted other people to perceive him, that he was able to do that. I say that very trepidatiously. Peter was an amazing man of God. Uh, He accomplished more in a day when thousands of people were saved than I'll probably accomplish in my entire life. Uh, People kind of like to rag on Peter sometimes because of some of the mistakes that he made, but I have made plenty more mistakes than he has. Um, So I don't want to come across like I've got the soul figured out. I'm just kind of, you know, being critical of Peter. Um, But I do think that we can learn uh, from this mistake that he made, uh, even though he was such a great man of God. You know, I, I find it interesting, too, because you think of that theme, as we said, of Galatians and how you have freedom. And, and it just shows you that when you are authentic with Christ and we're not focused on the standard or we're not focused on what other people are doing in the sense, but our, our goal is to give the gospel, is to reach the lost, then it really does set you free in your own Christian life because you're not worried about what other people think. You're only worried about what God has told you to do, what he's already said about the matter. And so it really does express true Christian liberty and true Christian freedom uh, by not being held by a certain standard. Well, as a Baptist, I do this, or as uh, another religion, I would do it this way. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm free in Christ. And so my standard is what scripture has said. It's my final authority for faith and practice. 
And so that sets me free as a Christian and as a believer. Uh, I want to I want to close with this, Brother Quinlan, is uh, and and quickly here. If what is the damage that can be done from a, a lack of authenticity in the Christian's life, or even in a, in an entire ministry? Uh, what's the damage that can be done uh, in in having that lack of authenticity? Uh, a lot, a lot of damage can be done. Again, I'm reminded of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Jesus called them hypocrites, and they had standards that were just unmeetable by, by the average person, and, and they were rude, and they were mean about those things, and, and we understand that Jesus was, was very harsh for them. They weren't leading other people to the Lord. They weren't helping them grow spiritually. They were just kind of beating up on them, and we can kind of come across that way, too, if we're not careful. I think it's important for us to understand that my personal standards, I think the word personal there is important, is for me and the things that I'm responsible for. So me, my family, because I'm the husband, I'm the dad, I'm the head of my home. So I'm responsible for personal standards in those areas. To be frank, I'm not responsible for your personal standards or anybody else's for that matter. As a youth pastor, I'm responsible for the standards of my youth group. But I'm not responsible for the standards of those kids when they go home and they're in their own room or they're with their parents. The problem with the Pharisees is they were taking their personal standards and their rewriting and tweaking of the law in ways that it wasn't even meant to be from the beginning. They were applying those to other people. and You have to do this and you have to do that or you're not right and we're going to ostracize you. And that's just wrong. My personal standard is for me. When I look at other people, I just want them to love Jesus. I want them to draw close to the Lord. If they're not saved, I want them to get saved. If they need to grow spiritually and I can help them with that by sharing scripture and setting an example, I want to do that. And when somebody comes to me and says, hey, what do you think about this? I tell them. And then they can ask me why we have this standard or, or, or not. But when we don't have that authenticity, it's a real problem. I was actually out soul winning probably seven or eight years ago. And I was knocking on a door. And an older gentleman answered the door and I said, hey, I'm from Clearview Baptist Church at the time. Just want to invite you out to our church. He said, oh, it's a Baptist church, huh? I said, yes, sir, it sure is. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll never go to a Baptist church. He said, about 30 years ago, my daughter went to a Baptist church. and She was wearing pants. They made fun of her. They ostracized her. They told her basically she wasn't welcome. He said, how could they call themselves Christians and do that to somebody? He said, I'll never go to a Baptist church again ever in my life because of the way that they treated his daughter. That's a problem. Again, that's me trying to take my standards and throw them on somebody who really, uh, what that young lady needed if she wasn't saved was Christ uh, or a loving group of people to fellowship with her and be her church family and help her along the way. I think a lot of damage was done there because they weren't worried about being authentic and loving somebody else. They were worried about this all important standard in their church. So at that point, 30 years later, I couldn't even minister to that gentleman or his family because of the damage that had been done decades before. The damage for ultimately is that a soul may never enter into all of eternity with Christ because of our own lack of authenticity, uh, our own pharisaical life or, or hypocrisy. And may we be challenged, and I hope this is a help to you today, uh, to be authentic with the Lord. Know what the Lord has convicted you about. Know why you have those convictions. And from Scripture, why God has given you those uh, convictions. And whether it be uh, specifically for that conviction, or maybe God has given you some, some word uh, from Scripture to help you with something that may not be super clear in the Scriptures, but it is a Scripture verse that can keep you safe and keep and maintain a strong testimony for the Lord. Because ultimately, everything that we do, everything we say, all the places that we go to are to be a reflection or an ambassador for Christ. Uh, when we're at the amusement park or when we're out in a park or we're out in our own yard or even uh, sometimes we're just out in public uh, at Walmart, we are still a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need and we desire to help you be real in your Christian life. It'll give you the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else and give you the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. Certainly thankful for uh, Pastor Quillen taking the time out of his schedule to be with us here on this podcast, this help podcast. I trust it was a blessing to you. Look forward to seeing you back again here. Thank you for watching the help podcast. We hope it was an encouragement to you. If you have any questions, you can contact us at 419-668- 
1-800-273-4629. You can visit our website at norwalkbc.com or you can contact us via email at info at norwalkbc.com. Or you can feel free to write us a letter and send it to 2084 U.S. Highway 20 West, Norwalk, Ohio, 44857. Again, thank you so much for watching. Please join us again next Saturday for another episode of The Help Podcast.